Hello, BookTube. Micah Cummins and I are doing a buddy read for the month of March of this. James Cavell's 1975 novel Shogun, which was, it's an enormous thing, and it's historical fiction, and it was a success. <laughs> it was a great success. It sold like crazy in hardcover. There were deals, Book of the Month Club, serialization. There was a paperback deal that just earned out and earned out for years, almost a whole decade. There was also a miniseries that you may be familiar with that uh, that was also really, really popular. You slap a miniseries cover on the paperback and suddenly you've got two million more sales. So although it's facing really stiff competition, I'm sure that some names would come to mind, uh, this is still one of the most popular and successful works of historical fiction in the 20th century. And it takes us back to the year 1600. This is the, uh, a historical novel that starts out on the scurvy rack decks of a 260 ton Dutch warship named the Erasmus, whose holds are full of gold and textiles and also all sorts of log information, navigational information, which at the time, accurate information along those lines was far more valuable than gold or or precious cloths, when the Erasmus is caught in a storm. The crew is very much depleted. They are dying of rickets, slowly but surely. The one who's in the strongest shape, because he's been rationing his vegetables, is uh, not a Dutchman. He's John Blackthorne, who is their pilot. He is in, in stouter shape than the rest of his men, some of whom are bedridden, including the captain of the vessel. And the storm that they encounter overwhelms them. And it could be that in, in many, many a story, that would be the end. But instead, that's the beginning. Because they have made it through the Straits and have encountered the island of Japan. They are saved, and their ship is saved, uh, on the coastal town of Anjiro. And they are all brought on land by the, the inhabitants of that town, including uh, the headman of that town, a man named Omi. And uh, that's when we're, we're seeing this through the eyes of, of Blackthorne at first. And we see him uh, awaken to this strange new world. It is assumed by the Japanese that, that take him in that he is the leader of their group. And unfortunately, uh, well, <laughs> it's, not, it's not neither fortunate nor unfortunate. Clavel seems to be under that impression as well. He says many times at the beginning when we're on the very tense, very well done opening scene on the Erasmus, he says that the pilot is the master of the vessel, not the captain. Uh, and Clavel's had a lot of experience in the world and a lot of experience on the ocean. He ought to have known better, <laughs> but I guess, I guess maybe he was under some sort of impression or was dry, wanting to drive home some sort of point. Uh, it's just a weird thing because it's not regional and it's not respective to culture or to time period. The captain is God on the vessel. He's not a crew member. He's God. He has literally the power of life and death. And that has always been true in every culture that has ever ventured out on the water. So I don't know what Clavel is getting at there, but the the Japanese, the villagers and the, the, the samurai who take him in very much believe that. And he, once Blackthorn reawakens, he doesn't dissuade them of that because all of his shipmates are being kept together in a nice but confined house. They have guards outside their door, whereas cons because the village people think that Blackthorn is the leader, he is lodged by himself and given the freedom of the village, he can walk around as he pleases. And it's a steep learning curve. Very steep. He doesn't know anything of the language. They only barely know anything about him because, as he quickly learns, he and his men quickly learn to their horror. I mentioned before, I mentioned when we were beginning, when we announced this, that this is a first contact novel because you are in Blackthorne's position while he is learning all about this weird land where he's found himself, where the culture is completely different, the thinking is completely different. At a couple of times, in the we're reading about 200 pages for this week, and a couple of points in the 200 pages that we're reading, it's not just the language and the culture, it's that both the Japanese characters and Blackthorne routinely think that the other is not actually human. 
Uh, so there is that kind of a first contact element involved, but if that is true, then the Missionaria Protectiva has already been here. There has already been a kind of contact. Blackthorne is horrified to learn that there is a priest, many priests, that as we're told, he's not told, but we're told that quite a few Daimo, the regional governors, quite a few Shogun are Christian. And, of course, if you want an un friendly welcome for a Christian, what you'll need is for the welcoming committee to be made of other Christians. And that is that happens right away. The priest and Blackthorn do not get along at all because they are rival squabbles of their rival sects of Christianity. But, and it, that's important because the priest is the only way that he can make himself known to his captors and his hosts. He doesn't know the language and the priest haltingly does. And uh, they want to know about Blackthorn because they have inventoried his ship, <laughs> and it is, well, the Japanese lords involved. There's there's uh, Omi, but there's also his uncle Yabu, who's who's a regional daimo, a regional a regional governor. And when they learn what's on this ship, this is the the ship has many many working cannon with ammunition, far more than exist anywhere in Japan. They have enough money to change literally the country. It has to be inventoried, disguised, kept heavily under wraps because it has the potential to change everything. And they want to they want to know from Blackthorn what is going on here? Who are you? Where are you from? And the priest wants to know as well because his country has made inroads into converting the Japanese to Christianity. Uh, that process is very halting at first because Blackthorn doesn't know the language. He doesn't know the custom at all. He's forever making mistakes. And that is, at first, very well done on Clavel's part to put us in his position. Clavel is assuming, I think probably rightly, that before Shogun appeared, most Americans did not know anything about 17th century Japan. They, most people did not know about these customs and how different they would have been from you know, what they would have read about Elizabethan England in a history book or, or gleaned about it from Shakespeare. Uh, that works really well. But very early on in the 200 pages that we're reading today, Clavel realizes that he can't stick to that or he will lose you. It's, it's fascinating, yes, and frustrating to be so totally a stranger in a strange land that you don't know a single word of the language. But if you stick to that and never broaden it, you will eventually bore your reader, and Clavel is too good a storyteller not to know that. So he shifts the narrative focus. It's on Blackthorn for the beginning, but then it moves to other people. It moves to Omi. It moves to Yabu. It moves to these people who are, through their conversations with their own people, they are able to fill us in on this, the situation, on the world, the broader world that Blackthorn has encountered. And it's a small narrative tip of the hat, but you knew it was going to happen anyway. But the only reason Clavel is putting that broader picture explanations in there is because Blackthorn is going to become deeply involved with those broader pictures. He is not going to stay a provincial curiosity being stared at by little children. <laughs> Instead, he is, he is going to become involved on the highest levels of power. But that doesn't happen in the part that we're reading here. What happens in the part, we, we learn about that situation. There was once a grand warlord, a Tycho, uh, who set up a regency council for his young son before he died. And that regency council, like most regency councils, have each one has their knives out for the other. Two in particular, Lord Toronaga and Lord Ishido, they have their knives out for each other, They and most of the rest of the country is falling in line with one or the other of them, anticipating some kind of civil war anticipating that a regency period in such a warlike culture for a little boy who has 10 more years to go before he can rule is doomed. Whether or not that anticipation is correct, we will see in the rest of this book, but it's only through the broadening of the aspect of the narrative to include other characters that we learn any of that, and it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Blackthorn encounters all kinds of differences between himself and his hosts, uh, they are comfortable working naked. They're the the help, the gardening, and whatnot. They're they're comfortable working naked. They put an unbelievably high price on courtesy. 
uh, such a high price that if you don't show it, it's a mortal insult. Blackthorn has to learn this very quickly. He is a smart man, and he is also not crude like some of his shipmates are. He, he is, we, we quickly come to realize he is naturally courteous. So he just needs to learn how important it is here. Also, uh, a few other things <laughs> in, the, in the Japanese culture that he encounters. Bathing is not only encouraged, but very routine. It's very healthy. Uh, it's not. In the, in, the, in the England of Elizabeth, it was not routine at all. It was much like in the, England, in the England of Elizabeth and for centuries later in the West, it was actively discouraged. Uh, also, eating the food in the world that he encounters is very different. A very high priority put on fresh vegetables, fresh water. A far, far cry from what Blackthorne knew in England you know, the heavy grog, the ale, and also a large amount of, of meat at every meal. Far different than that, and also, again, he adapts very quickly. He comes to think that it is far healthier, that he likes it more. And also the people involved. We aren't, we aren't 10 pages in to the 200 pages that we're reading today before Blackthorn gets a taste of what this incredibly hierarchical feudal system is like. There are levels. You have a village headman. You have a regional governor, you have a governor over him, and every one of them has the power of physical coercion over everyone below them. They place a high premium on courtesy, but nevertheless, when, when uh, one of our characters early on in the book is greeted with a moment, a second, of apparent discourtesy, he beheads the man who does it. And moving with a lifetime of training with a sword, which again is something that strikes Blackthorn and his men as both odd and deeply disturbing. It is, it is disturbing to see that level of physical competence. But at the same time, although almost all of the samurai exhibit that same level of physical ferociousness, they are a warrior caste. They are a warrior class, which England at the time did not have. Um, at the same time, the Japanese characters that we get to know in these 200 pages are also sensitive. They value poetry and make it up on the spur of the occasion. Uh, at one point, much later on in these pages, our character is trying to describe the, the cold, burning anger that he can see in Blackthorn's eyes at being captive. And the person he's trying to describe it to, his, his uncle, says, well, make up a poem about it right now. I mean, d describe it to me as a poem. And uh, it works on Blackthorn. Eventually, it works on him. There's a climactic scene right at the end of the 200 pages we're reading today where he is forced to admit that he is horrified by these people but also admires them. They are strange, but to him, to his eyes, to his Western eyes, they are strange, but they are loyal in their way. They are incredibly brave in their way. They, in other words, speak to him in a way that we have seen abundantly is not true with his, his Dutch shipmates. We follow their fates. A couple of their fates are really bad. We follow their fates, but there is no, there's camaraderie in the sense that Blackthorn does, he is their leader, and he does not want them taken advantage of while he's their leader. There's a, a kind of a downward flowing bond of loyalty. They don't seem all that loyal to him, but he's that loyal to them, but no fellow feeling at all. The fellow feeling that our main character starts to feel in these 200 pages is for his alien captors. And that, uh, I don't want to spoil things, of course, but that gets enormously greater as the book goes on, as he, info, as he inserts himself greater and greater into Japanese society. And the only way that he can do that, the only way that he cannot be an outsider, and again, this is, I am not making a contemporary political point in a, uh, my own country, which has gone completely round the bend into complete insanity on the question of immigration. So I, the last thing I want to do is wade into those waters. But nevertheless, Blackthorn realizes after all, he realizes in the next 200 pages that we're going to be realize, that we're going to be reading that the only way to stop being an outsider is to learn the language. Otherwise, you are stuck. You are just stuck. You will only know your own people, you will only know your own kind, and no one in your country, your adopted country, will ever take you seriously. Uh, <laughs> again, I'm not, no, no political drama, it's one way or another here, but uh, we're going to see much more 
integration of our character into Japanese society. But here, these 200 pages is the shock of uh, greeting. The shock of two worlds colliding. Actually, three worlds colliding. Because there's Blackthorn, who doesn't know what's going to happen to him. He doesn't know what's going to happen to his men. And there's also the Japanese, who know that he's a stranger, and also some of them, Yabu, wants to use him, use what he knows, use what he can tell him about his own cargo. And there's also Father Sebastio. There's also the, the priest, representing a third axis of worlds colliding here. It, uh, the 200 pages that we read today are the opening of this book. Clavel was uh, no fool. He was a full-grown adult. He was a, a self-reflective, tough, conscientious craftsman. I know that a lot of this will be sounding really strange if you only read contemporary literary fiction. <laughs> Nevertheless, he was an actual person, uh, not a hot, hot, hothouse flower. And he knew perfectly well that this, these 200 pages, this, we read uh, part one. I read just part one for today. I will speed up the pace, I think, next week, but I slowed down because I had a guest. Uh, Clavel knows that part one is the most, that if you're asking your reader to, to commit a thousand pages to a historical novel, that part one is the most important part. It's not the most dramatic part. Oh my God, the dramatic payoffs later on in this book are unbelievable, but it is the most important part. Think, when you read these 100 pages, I don't know how many of you are joining me and Micah for our, for our buddy read, but when you read these 100 pages, just think for a minute how many ways that these could have been done wrong. This could have been botched, and you wouldn't go forward with the book if there were. So, I, I haven't read this in 10 years. I was very, very happy to find that all still in place. I appreciated it even more. Uh, for this buddy read. So we're going we're gonna to stop there. Where I'm stopping at part one. I'll read part two at least. For next week, Micah and I did not set any kind of a time frame in terms of parts or page numbers or anything like that. We want to sort of get through the whole thing by the end of the month. Uh, I'll read part two, and if that doesn't seem like enough, I'll, I'll go on from there. But I'm curious to know, if you're joining us for Shogun, I'm curious to know what you're thinking about this, whether or not it is. I think that these 200 pages are incredibly inviting. If you're reading the book for the first time, feel free to let me know if that's true for you. Uh, and also, those of you who have already read this book, I am assuming that like most that most of you, if you've read this book already, read it a long time ago, like I did, 10 years or more ago. Are you joining us? Were you even tempted to join us? I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear about all of it, so let me know. But in the meantime, I will wrap this up until next week, and I will see you then. Thank you, BookTube.